Well, welcome to another session of Go To Unscripted. I am here with Matt Turner. Hi. Uh, and I'm Eric Johnson. Uh, I'm a principal developer from uh, for serverless from AWS. Uh, but I don't know. We might talk some AWS today. I don't know. Well, I think we're talking. Yeah, a little, little serverless maybe. Yeah. Tell me who you are. What do you do? Uh, so I'm Matt Turner. I'm a software engineer at Tetrate. We do uh, service mesh Istio stuff. Okay. Um, we're a vendor in that space, and yeah, I do do some software engineering and some community, some dev relations. I like. I take our stuff, I see what it can do, I, go, I try to explain that to people. I'm like, can, it, can we plug it into that system and that system? And if I can make that work, like, you know, here's a GitHub repo full of that, here's a, here's a blog, here's a talk about it. So. You do a lot of consulting then, right? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, okay. I have been an independent consultant, okay. but yeah, I'm kind of out in the field now with, okay. with Tetrate, yeah. Nice. All right, well, just before we get too much, just so you know, we are coming live from Go to Amsterdam mm -hmm. uh, here in, guess where we are? Amsterdam. Amsterdam, yes. Yep. So you can clever, tell from the clever naming. Yes, yes. <laughs> the view. The, uh, this is actually a beautiful room. Um, yeah, this is really cool. This is the first room I ever spoke in. Wow. So yeah, uh, years ago I did a talk called uh, "Attitude of Iteration," uh, right, and it was nice. about overcoming challenges. And we just, you know, I just did a bunch of one finger jokes. And we had a good time. So. Anyway. It was more than that. <laughs> but, yeah, it, so. Eric's talks are worth a watch. They are more than there are one finger jokes. They're great. <laughs> there's, there's, there's also there's also great content. Have you ever seen this one? Hang on. Wait. Uh, let's see if I can do it. <laughs> okay, I want that on tape. That should, that needs to be in the video, so it's gonna get cut. So <laughs> that's gonna be a gift now. That's yeah, yeah. Be, all right. uh, so yeah. Mean. All right. So let's uh, let's jump in. So tell me, you have a talk coming up. I do. Yeah, I do. yeah. This what are you afternoon. talking about? I'm talking about. Um, I call it cloud native progressive delivery. Uh, okay. So I'm talking about. Spoiler alert, I guess, for the talk. Yeah, yeah. Go afterwards. yeah, watch this after the talk. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> um, I guess a lot of people talk about CI and CD, right? They okay. talk about continuous integration, continuous deployment, and those are sort of the two stages. Or continuous. Or delivery. delivery and this is the right. thing. And there's and, and people, I mean, people have written books on this topic. I'm not hopefully going to do like a 101, like right. a, a sucking eggs. I think the go to audience is a bit better than that. Like, there's, there's quite, some quite good understanding. Um, but it's basically saying that, yeah, if you, if you separate build from deployment, which obviously yeah. you should, and then separate deployment from release. So deploying, like getting your software, getting your container image, say, running in production is deployment. Yeah. And then it's sat there. It can talk to production databases. It reads production configuration. It can talk to the other production services. But it's not released if it's not getting user queries. So if uh, you've got okay. something like yeah. an API gateway or a service mesh that can do that more advanced traffic control, yes. then you can have that thing running in production and you can test it. You can you know, port forward to it. You can set some headers or whatever. You can, you can hit it with test traffic. You can get automated you know, regression testing or load testing. You can start canarying traffic into gotcha. it, okay. but you can roll it back. So you're getting, you're getting the most representative test because it's in prod. I've had services. We had one right, yeah. that just got deployed to staging. Everything looked great, right, right. rolled it out into prod. Crash loop just wouldn't start because somebody changed the config file format, right? And it hadn't changed. Just silly things like that, plus yeah, yeah. actually access to prod data and access to other prod services. So, so you can deploy like that, but you're not. You, you then, and that's risk free, right? You can yeah, then yeah. just do that, and you really do do it continuously. Yeah. Because so many organizations, I think, have continuous deployment. They have the machinery for it, but somebody somewhere has to go press an approve button, or it has to happen on a Tuesday. I so do. you can deploy, and you do that, you just move that problem, don't get me wrong, in some yeah. ways you are moving that problem right. to release, but you get so much more value automatically by at least wrapping deployment up. I do a lot of speaking on, specifically for serverless, but speaking all on CICD pipelines. And mm. it was always, I always thought it should be CICD or D. You know what I mean? Because right, it's like, yeah. is it deployment or is it deployment? But anyway, that's, you know. Um, and one of the jokes I say, but, but truly honest, is, is if your deployment process includes somebody's name, mm. it's not automated. Because right. I can't tell you how many companies I worked as a solutions architect for a partner company, and how many times I would come in and go, okay, tell me about your, tell me about your CI/CD process. Tell mm. me how, how do you deploy? How do you release? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, we're fully automated. Oh, that's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, tell, yeah. tell me about it. Well, Bob <laughs> yeah. does whatever, yeah. and then Jan does whatever. It's like. Stop. Jan's got delegation of authority. Yeah. Like, yeah. If, if Jan's off sick, we know who to call. Yeah, so exactly. we're automated. We're yeah. redundant, man. Like Jan, Jan's husband will drive down. <laughs> yeah, and we're, push going, we're going to the mood. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So it, it's like that. That doesn't work, you know. And so I think you're right because I know for me, and I don't want to steal your thunder. So, and I won't. Cause um, you're much more eloquent than I am. Obviously, well, you're it's the British accent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I try to British accent. My wife just says, 
Say, say banana? Yeah, no, I'm not doing banana. No, I did it. Oh, no, I got it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's, a, it's an old movie. So, well, you know what? Never mind. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, so, so that always interests me um, in how people approach that. One of, one of the things that I really encourage folks with CICD is, 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 you know, when we talk about why, well, why would we go through the process of automating? Because we do have Bob and Jan, right? Yeah. But the, pro, the, the reason is, is that repeatable? You know, we, we know that every time it's going to go A, B, C, D, and it's not one time because Jan was sick and right. Jan's husband had to come down <laughs> yeah, push the right. button. It's going to go A, B, D, C. Yeah. You know, and so that, that automation is so critical. Um, but the interesting thing that you're talking about, and we've had these long debates about should you test in production, right, yeah. should you not? And I do think you should test in I, production. I cover, yeah, I cover uh, testing in production. I just don't think you should only test in production. No. I think that's, right. yeah, so that's where, yeah. that's where we're at. But um, why do you think testing in production? I mean, you kind of alluded to it, but why do you think testing in production is so important? Because I think it's the only way you'll catch certain classes of bug. And I sure. like, I mean, I'm a Rust fan, right? I mean, right. I'm like, yeah, we should, you should do as much testing as possible before production and testing. Right. People, you go to interview and people say, can you draw the agile testing pyramid, right? <laughs> and I'm like, there's a layer on the bottom. You've got your unit test on the bottom, I think. I had literally had this in an interview. No once. way. Well, I won't throw any company under the bus. Yeah. But there's this, this thing on the bottom is like unit testing. And I know below that is we've got a compiler. If you've got a language with a strong type system, you catch a whole class and, and a borrow checker and a lifetime checker, yeah, yeah, last yeah. plug for Rust. You catch classes and classes of error down there, right? And there's the formal methods people and the you know the Haskell people and whatever. So there's order that you should do as much as possible before production. But I think you, I think Charity Majors puts it well. You have to admit that you test in production yeah. because everybody does. That's good. There is yeah. there a use. I mean, reg, what's a regression test, right? It's a test case we didn't think of. It's a unit test we didn't have. Yeah. User sent us input that we never thought a user made that request. What? Why did they do that? Right. Okay. Write that one down. Store it. Replay right. it. Every version of the software because that's so crazy. We need to see what happens. So it, it's like uh, testing in production is undiscovered regression tests. Maybe is I love way that. To put it. Uh, yeah. I just came up with that. But no, I, it's I, good. Like, yeah, I like I'm, I'm going to take credit for it though because yeah. I think I pulled it out of you. you but um, so that's you know the Johnson Turner uh, Turner. Yeah, 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 yeah so okay. I did remember the yeah. So <laughs> the Johnson oh, Turner hypothesis. Johnson Turner. That it's alphabetical. You get it. Uh, so <laughs> Turner et al. Yeah. Oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see what you're doing. Yeah. I know your game. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, but <laughs> once you deploy something, it's released out there, what's the first thing you do? You go test it. Right. Uh, you know, right. it's, it's like, yeah. so, so you are testing yeah. in production. Right. I love that. But sense. no, I think, yeah, I know I think you're, you're right. You've got yeah. to test this class of the things you're never going to get. So, the, yeah, the talk is talking about um, you, can, you can have something deployed, right, stand in production, so you right. hit it with explicit test traffic, you set a header or something. Yeah. Explicit test traffic, so it's no users are affected, but it's testing in a representative environment. It just means that, you know, how many staging environments have you seen that are exactly like prod? Yeah, right? yeah, they, just, exactly. they can't be by definition because they're not prod. Or you just put like, huge amounts of time and money, I mean, you must have seen organizations with a huge AWS estate. Right. And they're like, we do IAC, this is great, so I can just make another copy of, of right. prod over here for like a staging test environment. And yeah, it's costing you $10,000 a month, <laughs> like, or whatever. But um, in serverless, that changes some. It changes some. It changes some. And so, and, and we had this conversation yesterday, but, I, and I don't think it changes enough where we go, don't do that, don't test the product. I do, I do think mm. the testing production, and like, like, you, like you're approaching that, with, especially with the canaries, and, yeah. and saying, look, just the developers are seeing this, things like that. But uh, with serverless, if, if you're not, I mean, I know you are familiar. So if you're watching this enough, familiar so is Matt's very familiar with serverless. Um, and it's Eric you, you, There is, you're, you're, when you're doing release, your infrastructure is code. Because you are, that infrastructure, it's the same infrastructure regardless of which account. Right, because we yes. at AWS are managing all that, right? So it's yeah, the same okay. infrastructure. Yeah. Because that's what a lot of what you're testing is. Uh, or, or, I guess let me say it this way. You're going to come a lot closer to have an identical environment yeah, on serverless. I, will, I won't commit to 100, although I, we probably are there. But, uh, you know, I don't want somebody to come back. You said it. So, right. uh, you know, I said, that was Turner. That's um, just the so Johnson. <laughs> that's just the Johnson hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the boss, right? <laughs> so, yeah, there we go. So, uh, you do serverless. But no, you're right. To, some? Uh, I've done a little. I've not done that much. Well, okay, so what is what is serverless? Okay, I was going to say, you said you had some questions. Well, because I feel like you, you say serverless, a lot of people think. I'm glad you asked. Lambda. Yeah, yeah. So, so you say cloud native. 
yeah, those well, aren't the same, although we no. fall into that yeah. uh, cloud native meaning. So, so define cloud native to me first. Well, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> difficult. I'm going to get this. There's people out there so much more qualified. I'm going to okay. get, I'm gonna get uh, roasted for this. I mean, to me, it's... Do the 100 level. Yeah, okay. So, so to me, it is cloud. I mean, that sounds silly, yeah, yeah. but like we got, no, we got no data centers. We got no lead time. We've cut... I mean, this is probably getting to what you're going to say about serverless. We've, we've cut several layers of infrastructure that we have to understand yeah. and operational burden off the bottom of the stack. Right? We don't have to do physical security for a data center. We don't have to think about power redundancy. Right. Right? We've got rid of some lead times. So there's the advantages of cloud, somebody else's computer. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think the native part says, we were born there, but we, we, it's the, the system is designed to be there. So yeah. lift, and, like, lift and shift into cloud is absolutely a, a grand thing to do. Right? You should get out of a data center. Yep. You should get off prem, like, out of the broom cupboard. Like lifting and shifting into an EC2 and then going from there, like first step on the journey, absolutely yeah. valid. But to me, cloud native is something that was either, if you're lucky enough, greenfield, you know, born in the cloud, designed and only ever run in the cloud, or something that's where you know the engines have been changed in flight and you've and you've rearchitected something to work in a a cloudy way, right? right. Such as it's it's um, got lots of st you know, it's it's stateless as far as possible so that you can get redundancy by horizontally scaling. You can get uh, performance from horizontally scaling. Uh, you've got infrastructure as code so that your environments are reproducible around yep. the world and reproducible for tests. So all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, and, I, and you're right. So, so you take that and kind of go to the next level serverless. Right. Is, it's just probably more abstraction. Um, although we say cloud native a lot with serverless as well. Yeah. Um, just simply because we say, uh, you know, it, it, it's a service in the cloud rather than you spinning up a VM in the cloud and building your own service. Okay, so the service is abstracting a lot of that work away from you. Mm -hmm. uh, and with serverless, so, so at AWS, there's, you could put 100 people in a room and get 100 different definitions of serverless, right? right? So at great. AWS, we kind of, uh, we, we, we have several tiers that we say is, first of all, uh, or several pillars. They're not the same as tiers. Right. You, no. Yeah, so yeah, like tiers, yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So the first is, uh, you know, no, no management. There's no, uh, mm -hmm. no computer, no patching. No, you don't do any infrastructure management. Yeah. Um, the second thing is, you pay for only what you use. Yeah. Uh, so, it's, and that's where we get into some debate. Uh, as people go, ah, oh, does it scale to zero because serverless, you know, at least a, a lambda function, mm -hmm. a step function, things like that, they scale to zero. Yeah, uh, and and we you know lots of services can scale to infinity and beyond. Oh, that's, that's a good reference right there. I like yeah. It. yeah. So, uh, but Spicy. they might have to trademark that one. So, but um, <laughs> but not a lot of services can come back to zero. Yeah. And and I think that's a that's a critical point. However, um, you know we have some services like a Fargate or something like that that may not come to zero, but they come pretty close. But they provide massive scalability. Um, and they can be faster as well. So I think, I mean, a lot of the cloud native technology will get you a long way there. I can, I can get a, I pay for what you use. I can get yeah. a Kubernetes cluster, the yeah. cluster scales based on yeah. VMs. Uh, there's, there's many vendors out there. It'll do you clever money. You know, when your cluster is going to scale, yeah, yeah. It'll, it'll go to the spot market versus on demand versus right. your reserved usage. It'll, it'll do clever optimizations. Right. And then within the cluster, your, you know, your workloads, your Kubernetes deployments can scale up and down as well. So you right. can be pretty elastic, but you can, you're always playing for that control plane. You, and you always can, have a base. And you yeah. get down to, yeah, you get down to one of every yeah. service and you always pay for the control plane. Yeah, yeah. Now maybe, maybe that's good enough, right? If you're huge and like maybe, maybe that's yeah. fine. And I, there's a lot of advantages, I think, to living at that level of abstraction. Yeah. Because you've got, you can, you can extend the Kubernetes control plane, you can add a service mesh, you can add all the things. So there's a lot of reasons, I think, to live at that level of complexity. But if you don't have to, yeah. No, you don't. You don't have to, but of course you'd want to. Well, yes, I mean, as in, if you if you don't have the requirements for yeah, it, I would say that no. you want to. If you don't have the requirements for it, then yeah, maybe you could use. Yeah. You know. Well, and, and one of the things we talk. About, I, mean, I was playing with you, honestly, but one of the things we talk about, and, and you make some good points, is um, when we talk because you know, why serverless or when serverless, when Kubernetes, things like that, or when ECS, when Fargate. At AWS, the way we kind of look at it is, first of all, right tool, right job. Right, uh, and we have a lot of companies, and I am a fan of this. We have a lot of companies that go, you know, we're serverless first, but if it doesn't work in serverless, mm -hmm. then we roll it. Then, serverless then, native. Yeah, yeah, serverless. Yeah, serverless native. No. But uh, companies, you know, I, I won't name a bunch of them because some are U.S. things like that. But we have companies that say we build everything serverless first, but some workloads don't work. 
Mm. So we'll, we'll roll that off to containers. But the other option we have, and this leans more to what you were saying, is we have some folks that say, look, I want to be able to turn more knobs and levers right. than serverless gets me. And so if you look at the spectrum of compute in AWS, you start with the EC2 instance, right, where you manage all the knobs and levers. How long is it up? How powerful uh, compute? All those kinds of things. Um, but you patch. You know, you do you do yeah, security. Right. You're up in the middle of the night when it goes down. Things like that. Then you kind of move up the stack, and you have the you know the EKS and the ECS, where you're managing clusters, um, and you still manage a lot of a lot of things. But you get some. You're not patching operating systems and stuff. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you might be depending on. Well, what you can. Yeah, exactly. yeah, but you don't have to. But not the core. You know, right? Yeah. So. Um, and then, and then you can kind of keep, you know, Fargate, where it's a lot of the more, a lot more is abstracted out, and then finally serverless. And what we talked with folks is, is someone comes down to preference. We know our our app more than anybody else, even more than AWS. Uh, we being the the company, right? Yeah. And we want to be able to modify and turn that. We have the skill set, and yeah. that's fine. That's what we say. Okay, go to EC2, go to EKS, go to ECS, depending on where you're. But we have a lot of comes good look. We don't want to deal with all that. We just want to we want to put our code in, and we, we want to get moving really fast. Right. Proof of concept, we, and we don't have the skill set to patch yeah. and manage and turn all those knobs and levers. And that's really when people say, "What should I use?" That's kind of one of the things I lean towards. Is this this is you know where your definition? And of course, you know, being a serverless DA for for <laughs> you know Amazon, I'm going to say serverless because I do believe in serverless. Right. I, I'm a huge yeah. fan of it. Um, but right tool, right job. Um, right, exactly, and I believe, yeah, I believe yeah. in Kubernetes and Istio and a, a whole bunch of problems that they can solve. And I think that's what we look at at, at Tetrade is, is if you're a slightly larger organization, your software's been around for longer, like you have, there's so much to know, and you've got the people that know all of yeah. it. Yeah. And yeah, those levers, you don't want to be patching OSs, you don't want to be doing data center physical security, but you you maybe want to um, extend your Kubernetes, extend your network, sure. you can... You can Write some Rust or some JavaScript. You can compile it to Wasm. You can inject it into so many places with your network proxies. You can use our Wasiro product to embed that into any GoLang program. So you, yeah, you can get that kind of control. And yeah. I think we're looking at people saying cloud native is is great. Like yeah, if, yeah. if you've if you've been born in the cloud and you've only ever done greenfield on a on a cloud provider, then that's awesome. But Actually, if you're an enterprise with a bunch of site offices yeah, and a yeah. bunch of some stuff is still on-prem or there's regulatory requirements or you're multi-cloud or any of these reasons and you want you know, smart, observable, elastic compute and smart, observable, secure networking, but you've got to plug those things together across mm -hmm. continents and across cloud providers, then you need to have that understanding, you need to have that control. And we try to take as much of that burden off you as probably we've got our management plane, we try to take as much of that burden off off you as possible and do what we're good at so that you can do what you're good at. But yeah, what you're yeah. good at has got to be running those bigger legacy systems. The, yeah, yeah. And and so. uh, he's, again, as a start, that was a lot of the conversations we had as right. well as like, uh, and, and you said it earlier, get to the cloud as yeah. fast as you can. I mean, yeah. that's the, the, the folks that are running their own data centers, I really, I, I, this probably turned into more of a session <laughs> than an interview. Probably. So get to the cloud. Yeah, the cloud. Yeah. Uh, but but there, that was one of the things we set out and said, how do we get you to the cloud? And a lot of times it's that lift and shift like you right. referred to earlier. Well, uh, we found that we can help people with that actually. So if you get things into a service mesh, if you have, uh, you can establish like a beachhead in the cloud and you can yeah, yeah. then get your, your yeah, layer, yeah. your smart layer seven networking yeah. And you can actually apply it in the data center on VMs before you've gone to the cloud, before you've gone to containers. We've got ways. We, yeah, we've got ways to get that stuff right okay. really easily into into the data center and into VMs and get that stuff observable and under control. Because then you know you try to move. Then you start that. Be, being in the cloud right. is is great. Being yeah, yeah. in the data center is better than being split across two because yes. then you've got like a, a VPN link or a like yeah, yeah, a whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if we can help with that stage, then we actually have find that people find that lift and shift a lot easier. They think, oh, well, you know, my stage is I'm going to build up the tech stack, right? So I'm going to dockerize everything and then I'm going to put it in Kubernetes and then I'm going to add a service mesh. Yeah. And then I'm, we're like, no, actually, if you start by getting control of what really counts, which is the sort of resiliency and, and security of your of your requests. It's the preparation for, and, and I think that's where mm. a lot of companies fall, is uh, here we are. Here's, here, here's our, the, we don't know how it works, but just right. get us on the cloud. Yeah. But if you can come in and go, okay, now, now we've, we've organized this, we know how it works. Look, much like what you're saying, well, let's add these layers, let's add this, we now have a good, because, how many how many companies have you talked to? We go, 
it's kind of a black box to us. Yeah. You know, a lot of them. And so, okay, we know how it works. Now we can, you know, we talk about strangler pattern and things like that where we say, okay, let's start pulling some of, some of those out. Mm -hmm. and, and excuse me, you have that ability to start plucking those much if you know your application. Right. That's, that's one of the long conversations I'd have with, with customers is, tell me about your application. Well, yeah, that's the first, because that's like, oh, Dave wrote it, and Dave, but Dave left 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah exactly, I think, yeah. And that's the first, and that's how I describe Kubernetes to people, right? Because mm -hmm. you can talk about, I mean, I've been on panels where you talk about Kubernetes as the new POSIX, and, and sure it is, it's this great, flexible, extensible API sure. for accessing compute, and it doesn't actually have to be containers underneath, and it doesn't have to be real VMs, it can be, it can be a some kind of serverless compute. But you know, that's the very abstract, high valuting kind right. of way to, to look at it. To a lot of people, it's like, I've got some containers, and I've got lots of, I can run a container on one computer by typing yeah. Docker run, yeah, yeah. right? I've now got a thousand computers. Right. Kubernetes is the thing that, yeah, that yeah. like does that. And I was, so what I say to people is, okay, all of these configuration, all of these different resources you can make, you're describing your application to Kubernetes. You're yeah. saying, this is what it looks like when it's healthy, when it's unhealthy, this That's is right. how it scales. This, oh, I need the minimum, this thing forms a Paxos consensus, so I need a minimum of three. You have to tell Kubernetes that stuff. And the same with Istio or any other service mesh. Yeah. You tell it, oh, this is an idempotent operation, this is not, so you, you can retry this. Yeah. So you have yeah. to know, it starts with you have to know. Yeah. And that's where I think a lot of our companies fail mm. in preparing for that move. Uh, it, I, how many times you go, I, I don't know, we yeah. don't know. And, and I get that because of what you said, the person who built it's gone. Yeah, right. We have to have it. We can't, mm. you know, there's no end of life to this. It has to happen. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, that, that's, uh, that's a painful point to them. Or it's, uh, you know, it's on a mainframe. Or it's on, or it's uh, on yeah, or something like that. Probably can't you, help you with the mainframe. Interesting side note, uh, we just had somebody, and, and I, I can't reference it right now, but I'll have to find it, who is running as a custom runtime, they're running R, RGP? Uh, uh, what's the IBM? RPG? RP, oh. I'm quite old, I'm not that old. Maybe. What's that? I'm, not, I'm quite oh, old, no, I'm not that anyway, old. It's, it's, it's what you run on S400. It's oh, a mainframe, wow. and they're running that code wow. inside of a, of a, a Lambda function. Wow, I think uh, the port, Kubernetes was ported, I'm gonna get this wrong, I think it was ported to the, to the Z-series architecture. Wow. And I think it was ported to, to ZOS. I think you can run it, I think you can run the kubelet and all of the mm -hmm. sort of data plane components. I think you can run on, I'm gonna get this wrong, ZOS on a Z390 processor, if those are even things that exist. Dude, I think what did do we need that we had to do that? You know, <laughs> yeah. like, who? We don't need it, we just could do it. <laughs> it's, it's either that or yeah. it's somebody who will never agree to be named. That's right. Funded that development. Like, right. I need this. I and don't even want to talk about yeah, why we're here. Here's a, a million dollars. Can, can you all just go and like do these ports for me? Yeah, and I'll yeah. take it away and I won't talk to you again. It's a step backwards. It's, you know, so, uh, well, it's a step sideways. Yeah, really, but it's, it, yeah, so, so t let's, let's jump forward a little bit. Uh, and I don't know time-wise where we're at, but let's talk about, uh, so we talked about you know, cloud native and things like that. One of the things is serverless. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull us to serverless yeah, a little okay. bit. So, yeah, um, event driven architecture, mm -hmm. uh, which not all event driven architecture is serverless, but no. all serverless is event driven architecture. Yeah. Does that make okay. sense? You still okay? So define server because okay, I think a lot so, of people so you say serverless. Serverless is lambda. It, now. I'm moving to you know I'm talking uh, step functions. I'm talking lambda uh, mm. functions. Uh, Chris Munz would have tackled me right there. You can't say lambdas. It uh, has to no, be lambda yeah, functions. Okay. So yes, um, but, but uh, like Aurora. Uh, what's that? Aurora. Aurora. Uh, there's an Aurora serverless. Yeah. So. Um, so it's that kind of stuff, and that's the real, because obviously I'm deep in the Kubernetes world and whatever, like compute networking, I got it, I want to pull right. the levers, I understand it. Right, right, right. I got to be, you know, databases, I don't understand databases. I yeah. just want to call a database. I just want there to be, there a, is, I yeah. just want there to be a network there, endpoint. There I don't want to upgrade the database, I don't want to back up the database, I don't want to certainly patch its OS, because I do not understand that stuff. You want DynamoDB. So to me, yeah, <laughs> right, I want something, so, so uh, I can name other vendors. Like, oh yeah, I, I want um, I want a cockroach, right? Or I want a, yeah, a spanner, cockroach or, or, Mongo, I want a spanner or, yeah, or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, so it's just ambient. Like, I just hit the network endpoint, and it just always works. Yeah. So all right. So let me go back. So serverless, so, we talked about. You know, you don't patch, you don't manage. Uh, you, yeah. you, it's scale to zero, uh, or it's, it scales as you needed. Uh, we we talk about pay for only what you use, and then all the security and stuff is is built in, and we handle that. Um, and in this, I'm just gonna manually box it uh, yeah. to say that, that at this point I'm talking about, you know, again, Lambda functions, step functions, uh, 
EventBridge. Uh, I'm talking obviously AWS, uh, you know, services, um, API Gateway. Yep. Uh, how how often do you do you work with EDA at all, like event driven architectures? I've done. I haven't done too much in the cloud. Okay. It's something I need to get to. Okay. Uh, and that's something that that we're we're driving at as we're as we're teaching folks. Um, that's where. So this again, it kind of, kind of comes back to the knobs and levers, right? Uh, we have a lot of folks. That this mentality says we don't want to do all the knobs and levers. We just want to say, this happened. Do something. Mm -hmm. And this is where the, this is where serverless really. And shines. you think serverless is the the best way to do that? I do. Yeah, yeah. I do in this respect because because I'm not one. I shouldn't have to have a server sitting out there or a cluster or anything no. saying, when did it happen? Listening on port 80 or port 443 and saying, when did it happen? When did it happen? Instead, I should just be able to say, that happened. I'm going to do something. Right? And so, for instance, you know, an IoT button, uh, data saved to a database, mm -hmm. um, you know, files dropped in a bucket, things like that. So it's a different way of thinking of polling mm -hmm. or always listening. Uh, and, and what we're seeing, and it allows customers, and, and it's also kind of a shift more, maybe this is another question for you, is it's a shift more to asynchronous processing yeah. versus synchronous processing. So I'm a big fan, I mean, so I'm a big fan, and actually okay. I'm quite an old guy, and you see, you see things come around in cycles, right? So to yeah. me, like, I'm thinking, I was always a massive fan of you know, Rx, the Rx libraries, Rx.js, Rx Go, okay. you know, Rx C Sharp. Um, that kind of uh, yeah, observable base, you know, that's asynchronous. It's pull based, yeah. and those things though, they kind of you download that library into your into your program, and it just kind of works. Yeah, yeah. And then you feel like you, but then sometimes you need to take more control over, like, hey, here's the compute pool, here's the thread pool for like right. this stage because this is the bit that's the bottleneck or something. So we were doing that in process, mm. um, and I've done a, a bunch of Elixir in my time. So okay. Erlang sort of Erlang stuff. So the actor model is also a really nice kind of. Event-driven architecture, uh, these, but these tended to be on one, like in one process on one machine. These were like monoliths. But I talk about this when I talk about microservices. I'm like, microservices are great. They've got a bunch of advantages. But we were never. They're about decoupling deployment. They're mm. about making architectures un distributed, understandable yeah. to teams. They're about distributing things. They're about getting those independent security contexts and sort of scaling boundaries and stuff. People to just talk about all oh, modularity, but like we were never bad at. I mean, there was definitely some mess made, but like we knew how to make the the knowledge was out there of how to make a good monolith, right? Mm -hmm. You had interface-driven development, you had compartmentalization, you had DDD, right? We were we were pretty good at making a sort of nice sure. compartmentalized dependency injection frameworks, all of that kind of stuff. We were quite good at doing that with monoliths, and yeah, all this event-driven asynchronous architecture. I've seen it inside a monolithic, you know, yeah. inside one Beam VM, yeah. right? One Erlang program, or inside yeah. one. Massive piece of Java, right? You can have a million lines of Java that this utterly sprawling mess with your dependency inversion problems and all kinds of stuff. Or you can have something that's actually Acker Scala, or it's actually Rx Java. Yeah, yeah. And it's really, really nice. So I've always been a fan of. Yeah, that and, kind and of stuff. I'm in no way saying we invented event driven. I know it's mm. been a regular. Sorry, I wasn't saying You're that. You're welcome. But, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's, yeah, that's the Johnson. Yeah, just Johnson event driven model. So, um, no, event driven has been around for quite a while. Um, but I think there's a there's a power. It, it's you know we struggle with folks kind of understanding because uh, yeah. like oh asynchronous versus synchronous. Mm. It's not always the case. You know you can have synchronous events being thrown in and, and responded, but most of it does kind of move to an asynchronous uh, move. But yeah, I know that. So kind of side quest here. The last time I did one of these interviews several years ago was actually with one of the I don't think he was the founder, but one of the core users of Erlang. Oh, wow. And it was, uh, and I'll have to come up with the name, and I know that the folks probably hanging out probably know. Yeah. Because it came out of Ericsson, right, in Sweden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, the was he, yeah wow, wow. he was there. Yeah, he was there when all this was happening. Ulf oh, Uyghur. Okay. You know him? I, no, uh, no, I they don't know. They were, and then, and then the other guy was like the, the genius of Elixir, and how oh, Elixir God. was based on, yeah, and, yeah. and I mean, I, mean I, I can't spell. You know, either one of them, you know. So, uh, no, apologies Elixir, to the Danish speakers. I yeah, I yeah, it looks like something you mix in a bottle, right? So, I, I, yeah. I didn't, you know, so, but it was fascinating. And in my, I've, I've done a little Erlang when we learned to, you, you know, Erlang has a great framework for communication between yeah. uh, devices, and we had to set up uh, RabbitMQ. 
Right. And you yeah. had to, I, I mean, literally, I'm reading docs and pushing buttons <laughs> and stuff. But I got it working, and mm. it was this event driven kind of queuing yeah. system. Um, well, within a process, everything is an actor. So you sort of take the. The textbook definition of object-oriented programming, I guess, came from small talk. So they say that you know, you're passing messages. Think of it as passing messages yeah. between objects. Yeah. But of course, you're like in small talk, maybe you are. In Objective C, actually, you, you kind of are. But in, in a C sharp or a Java or a C you're making a function call, right? You're, yeah. you're like you're you're pushing some arguments onto right, a stack. Right. You're changing right. the program counter. Right. Like it's very coupled. It's it's very right. synchronous. Right. Um, but Erlang actually says no. Each each instance of a of an Object of a, of a class, if you want to look at it like that, each one of these actors genuinely does have like an inbox, and it has messages that yeah. it has its own little thread. I mean, it's a lightweight thread, but it has its own little thread of execution that it'll it'll sort of churn through the messages in its inbox. And if it goes down, and if it goes down, then there's there's actually a service discovery. If it goes right. down, it'll get restarted. Like that's if right. it crashes, it's isolated. Uh, it doesn't take the rest of the monolithic process down. And that's down. built into the framework. For the, yeah, so yeah. that's built. So the Beam Beam is the name of the VM. Okay. Like the JVM, you can compile Java, Kotlin, Scala for, for the JVM. Um, Erlang was the original language. So I, Elixir is like Ruby for the Erlang VM. That's okay. how I describe it. So it's a much nicer, more modern, friendly language. It just compiles to Beam bytecode. Okay. So you can look at one running like Linux process, and that can even be a distributed system and have a bunch of actors inside it. And then as you say, you can take that. They had they had like a native mechanism to take that across machines where you would run Beam. You, your, your actors, you would have like, I don't know, 10,000 on this machine and 10,000 right. on that machine. And right. you'd have to set up like a, like a message bus for them to communicate over. I know it says in my title, developer advocate. It, it really, it's because they can't fit somewhat of a developer. Come advocate. I'm I'm, a, I'm an architect. That's what it does. Right, I mean, okay. yeah, and 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 that's I'm a serviceful architect that works with service. So this has been a. Uh, I learned a lot from you, honestly. I mean, you obviously right. know deep knowledge, and I love it. Well, uh, I've just been around it, but well, I've always I, liked that stuff. Yeah, well, yeah, you well, always like those patterns. I mean, there yeah, it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. big time. Yeah, it's yeah, all right. I've played with a lot of this stuff. It's I'm not fun. judging. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> but uh, been, like this, yeah, been a lot. I, I love how much uh, how much information is in this. This is a session in itself on just understanding a lot of you know, thought processes in, in coding and, and development and language and things like well, that. Well, maybe. So. I'd have to really think about it. And this session would have to mean not like, uh, what's the best way to put this? The session can't be like, um, oh, this is all, yeah, what are you all talking about? Like, this yeah, has yeah. all been done before. Like, what does Turner know? Yeah. <laughs> Well, either either that or like, oh, shut up about your Kubernetes. It's just, yeah. it's, it's just Erlang. Shut up about your Erlang. You obviously it's, love it's it. It's just yeah. small no, talk. No, no, and I love that. I mean, yeah. I think I love that pattern when you talk about adventure and architecture. And yeah, like, yeah, yeah, that's a it's a pattern I've always yeah. loved. Um, oh, it works, so to say, yeah. and it and it works. And we're just um, yeah, we're kind of taking it to the next level, putting it in the, you know, in the cloud. As I say, you had all these actors in one Unix process, then you had them across machines, and now right. each one is a pod or each one is a a Lambda function or, right. or something. Like the idea, I really loved um, Elixir could do it and Scala was very good at it. That was a DSL. You could write, because how many of those independent little communicating processes are just state machines? Oh, so right? is desired state language? Is that DSL when I? Oh, uh, domain specific uh, language. Okay, all right. So, gotcha. yeah. That's, so like, that, I think desired state was, that was Microsoft. Oh, maybe. maybe. There's desired, uh, maybe talking out my ear. Um, but, uh, yeah, there was a, Desired state process. There's these things, these yeah. TAs have been reused so many times. I can't remember that one. But yeah, um, yeah the, like a, a language We're, that's got a, yeah. a language that's got a syntax that's flexible enough that you can sort of extend it. Gotcha. So you can make like a language within a, within a language. Gotcha. Um, so in Scala or Erlang, you could write, you could just be very explicit about a state machine. Like here is my state table. Like what state am I in? What input did I get? Got it. Do this little thing got because it. you find out that so many of your think about how many classes in Java if you really squint at them actually could be reduced to quite a simple like, I'm in this state, I got this right. event, do this, go right. to that state. Here, like just, just that topple of, of simple. Yeah, that three topple thing. of where am yeah. I, what came in, yeah, like yeah. what am I outputting, where yeah. am I going? Okay, that's a four topple and I think there's a fifth element actually, like the formal definition of a state machine. Yeah. But in these systems you could often just write. And I think that's where something like serverless, something where we don't care about the infrastructure underneath is right. Is, is really great because maybe something does need to be a complicated piece of compute. Maybe I've lifted and shifted it. Maybe I bought it from a vendor. Maybe it's whatever, something on an EC2 or in a pod. Yeah. But then, you know, hey, this part of the system, we can just model that as a state machine. So I'm just going to write yeah. it in, in SAM or whatever, and we're just going to let it hum. And I don't care about any levers on that. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, 
Yeah, no, and the, there's a lot of power in that. Uh, yeah. I know we're, we are out of time. We are. Uh, we need so, to wrap yeah, it up. I'm going to wrap us up. Man, Might I, like get I one said, last pitch in for yeah, yeah. this bit. <laughs> uh, fantastic <laughs> yeah, conversation. Thanks for the uh, we are live from Amsterdam. Uh, mm-hmm. Matt Turner. Uh, Eric Johnson. And Eric Johnson, the Johnson Turner Hour. <laughs> and uh, Turner, Turner, Turner after Johnson Hour. And uh, mm-hmm. so, no, uh, but enjoy the time. Uh, hope you enjoyed this. Hope you get uh, some stuff out of this. And uh, anything you want to say before we go? No, it's been it's been fun. It's the yeah, great it's thing about unscripted, chat. isn't it? We just sit down, we yeah, yeah. we see what we chat about. Yeah, we've, um, we've kept it pretty civil. We've yeah. uh, we've agreed well, on yeah. most things. Yeah. Oh no. well, I'm gonna take you out after this, but <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I, yeah, I thoroughly camera. enjoyed the talk. No, so. it's been fun. It's been it's been a lot of fun. Good right. pleasure to speak to you, Eric. You bet. Enjoy the rest of the conference, and uh, we'll see you later. Yeah. See you around.